The story begins in a rural village where there is a river. In this river, several ladies were doing their laundry while talking about someone. They gossip about volunteer Shim's daughter who they believed had been sold for 300 sacks of rice. One lady also mentioned that the daughter of the volunteer was going to die as they heard the kid jump into the sea. The lady they were referring to is Chinji Shim, our main protagonist in this story. After jumping into the sea, she was always thinking about her father. Her father was waiting for her to come back but she already believes she won't ever see her father again. Volunteer Shim then discovered what happened to his daughter when there was someone who approached him and let him know everything. Shinji called herself a terrible daughter and she intentionally jumped into the sea as a sacrifice hoping that her father would live a long life. She was hoping to see the Dragon King in the afterlife as she believed that it would be good for her sake. Time had passed and she suddenly came to a dungeon. She was still unconscious, lying in a treasure and someone was trying to wake her up. As she slowly opened her eyes, she saw a monster which she thought was a goblin. She was calm and concluded that this goblin might be from the other world who came to her to pick her up. But then, she was wrong as it turned out to be a dragon. The dragon asked her how she got into the dungeon but she was surprised and speechless. If you heard the question, give me an answer. The dragon said. Shinji's eyes were sparkling out of excitement knowing that this dragon was the dragon king. She remembered her father and wanted to inform him that she was now at the dragon palace. Shinji, daughter of the Shim house, greets the dragon king. She said politely while bowing down. The dragon was confused and asked her what she was doing then she replied that she had sinned against the dragon king without knowing the subject. Still, the dragon was puzzled and didn't understand her at all. In addition, he thought from the very beginning that Chinji is an enemy knowing that people who entered the dungeon had an intention of killing him and begged for their life if they wouldn't be able to kill him. Chinji was still staring at the dragon and she said that it was an honor to finally meet the dragon king. The dragon didn't know what Chinji was saying at all. He didn't even know that he, Berkis, was a dragon king. I am a dragon king. He asked, and Chinji answered yes. According to her, the Dragon King had magical qualities, made mountains of gold and silver treasures, and was hiding under his treasures the whole time. All of these are rumored she heard back then which matches the dragon right in front of her. Berkey's flaunted water in front of Chinji and splashed it onto him while saying that he wasn't a Dragon King. Huh? What do you mean? Chinji asked. She was confused at this moment thinking that the Dragon King that was called Dragon King isn't a Dragon King. Berkeys then told her that she might be referring to the Dragon King before. 500 years ago, Berkeys, who had just become an adult, decided to delay making dungeons and instead took them away from others. The time he went to the dungeon, he instantly saw another dragon. It was Marion Kaiseris, the former owner of the dungeon who is strong enough to devastate the world. If you hand over the dungeon, I'll let you leave, Berkeys said. But Marion Kaiseris was not scared at all and even called him an insolent dragon. Both dragons were staring at each other, and at the same time, Marion Kaiseris activated a flame, but before he could attack Berkeys, Berkeys easily smashed him away and he instantly died. He tells this story to Chinji and proudly says that Marion Kaiseris died in his hands despite that he only hit him once. Chinji was not surprised, which confused Berkeys. For Chinji, Berkeys is more virtuous than the Dragon King for easily killing the former owner of the dungeon so she believes Berkeys must be the Dragon King. Berkeys was horrified. He was stomping while telling Chinji that he didn't want to be something bothersome like the Dragon King. He strongly stomped the ground. He fluttered his wings and got closer to Chinji, asking her once again how she got into this dungeon. As he continuously flutters his wings, Chinji feels a strong blow of wind. She then informed Berkeys that she threw herself into the sea and found herself in this palace without dying. Berkeys imagined himself that he was at the sea but then she didn't even see any seas around the dungeon so there is no reason for him to believe Chinji. Chinji then said that she cannot lie to the Dragon King. Berkeys then thinks that Chinji might have broken through the defenses. But then, he was sure enough that the defense is not a magic that humans can easily get through. And if Chinji really broke through the defenses, he was thinking that more humans could enter the dungeon every time and wouldn't give him any chance to sleep for the rest of his life. Thinking about it makes him upset. He ordered Chinji to tell the truth and stop lying. He was now angry and he concluded that Chinji must have been a secret or special talent that allowed her to come into this place. Chinji was thinking about the special talent she had. My specialty is, it's a taste of the hand. She said. Berkeys was puzzled as he thought that Chinji was spitting nonsense. According to Chinji, she was always complimented on how well she made soy sauce ever since she was a child. There was a lady in particular that gave her the most compliments. And there was a time when she helped out with a part-time job and found a talent for making Korean pancakes and noodles. She kept on chattering about the talent she had without knowing that Berkeys only wanted to hear how she got into the dungeon. Shinji suddenly felt sad as she remembered her father who always told her that the food she made was good. She started crying since her wish was to be able to serve her father plenty of good food. Other than delicacies, she can't make her father any food at all. She cried so loud since she was hurt knowing that there was no chance for her to see her father again. 
Berkeys was staring at her in confusion since he couldn't understand how Chinji, a lady who was very excited earlier, was now suddenly crying so loud. The loud cry of Chinji makes his ears deaf. He feels so tired since Chinji won't stop and becomes more loud when in fact, he doesn't understand what she is saying. He lay down on the treasures and decided to let Chinji cry and just sleep for now. If he sleeps for just 100 years, he believes it should possibly become quiet. Chinji always utters her father and Berkeys cannot even sleep because of how noisy she is. At that time, he didn't know the fate of a bothersome child, Chinji. He didn't even know that he could become a mourning dragon. 30 minutes later, Chinji finally calmed down. She still whimpers while wiping her tears. Her face suddenly blushed as she felt embarrassed for crying in front of the dragon king. She immediately bowed down to Berkeys and admitted her mistake. But then, Berkeys isn't responding as he was peacefully sleeping at this time. He was snoring which made Chinji think that he was sleeping deeply now. She was observing Berkeys and realized that Berkeys was really big, taller than the roof of her grandma's house. At this time, her stomach growled. She was empty since she hadn't had breakfast yet. She looked around but didn't see anything that she could eat. By looking around, the only treasure she sees is gold. She was walking while saying that this dragon's palace was certainly a marvelous place. Aside from feeling hungry, she was also looking for the maids and servants of the dragon but she saw no one. She followed the wind thinking that it would lead her to the outside. Her stomach was still growling and she was hesitant to just move around inside this dungeon without the dragon king knowing. She clenched her fists and concluded that could meet the people that serve the dragon king if she walked around. She followed her instinct but she only saw something that looked like grass. The moment she got near to it, she discovered that it was leaves identical to potato leaves. She then smelled it to confirm and started digging. Just by its appearance, she was sure enough that it was really sweet potatoes. After digging, she found a huge sweet potato and carried it. She was surprised because of its size and she believes it's like a peach from heaven. It was too precious for her so she was hesitant to eat it despite being so hungry. She then comes up with the idea that the dragon king must be hungry after waking up from a deep sleep so she immediately turns around and heads back to the dragon to let him eat the sweet potato first hoping that he would not be against Chinji. When he arrived, Berkeys was still sleeping. Chinji was thinking of how she could cook this potato now that she didn't have any things with her. Also, she doesn't want to serve a raw sweet potato to the dragon king. Luckily, she witnessed how Berkeys sniffed and exhaled a hot breath. With this, she believed she could use it to roast the sweet potato. She then looked for more things in the treasures but she didn't want to use it since it all looked very expensive. Since she didn't have a choice, she decided to search for a thing and found a sword. The moment she grabbed it, she wasn't aware that she also retrieved it. She then stabbed the sweet potato with this sword and started roasting it to the flame coming from Berkey's. Shinji felt how hot the flame was. She was sweating but she didn't want to stop roasting it since she didn't want to waste time. Back then, Chinji was called by her lady neighbor who gave her a basket of potatoes. The lady said that there was a harvest of potatoes which is why she gave Chinji some of it so she could take it to her home and eat it with her father. Chinji gave thanks to the lady and said that she didn't know how to repay her. But then, the lady said that there was no need. All she wants Chinji to do is to share with anyone who is in need. Chinji immediately went back to their house and informed her father that she would cook a roast sweet potato. She informed her father that she got it from the neighbor. That time, she knew that a good potato tastes good if it is roasted slowly over a light fire. At this present time, she smiled while roasting the potato thinking that the dragon king would like it. All of a sudden, she was startled the moment she heard Berkey's asking her what she was doing. Are you roasting that with my nose breathing? Berkey's asked. Chinji felt nervous. She was stuttering while she was trying to answer. Berkey's never expected to see Chinji after waking up since he thought that Chinji would have left by the time he was asleep. Also, he was annoyed seeing Chinji roasting something using his breath. He was thinking of killing Chinji right now for annoying him. But then, Chinji apologized to him and informed him that she was just preparing a delicious meal for him and admitted that she was thinking foolishly. And it's not that you were caught and you told a lie, right? Berkey said. He also told Chinji that he cannot fill himself up with the food coming from the dragon's palace. Chinji then told him that she made this meal with all her heart and was hoping that Berkey's would give it a try. She sliced some and handed it to Berkey's. Berkey's at this point was confused as to why Chinji roasted a sweet potato instead of escaping away from him. If it doesn't taste good, I'm going to eat you instead. Is that still okay? He said. Then, I will be a life sacrifice to the Dragon King. Even if I say I want to leave, it would not be of much help to me. Chinji replied. Surprisingly, Berkey suddenly transformed into a handsome man and he agreed to eat the roasted tomato of Chinji. Chinji was surprised. She was staring long at Berkey's so Berkey's thought that he looked weird in the eyes of Chinji. Chinji immediately handed the sweet potato to him, telling him to eat it carefully since it was still too hot. Chinji originally thought that the Dragon King would turn out to be a grumpy old man, but then she confirmed now that she was wrong since Berkey's was so hot and handsome for her. 
Berkey's grabbed a little bit of the potato while thinking about why Chenji was blushing. But, seeing Chenji's red face is very cute for him. He suddenly becomes shocked as he never thought it would come to his mind. He cannot believe now that he's saying a human is cute. He concludes that it may be because he doesn't have enough sleep. He also told himself that he should kill Chinji instead of eating the potato. Chinji at the same time was still nervous. She doesn't know that Berkey's is planning to kill her if the potato tastes bad. The moment he swallowed it, it was just a regular sweet potato for him. He was chewing it while thinking if a sweet potato is usually sweet like honey, not sugary but was just right. A balanced taste to be exact. And although it's chewy, he can still feel its soft texture as if he's falling asleep under a warm blanket. And he could say that the taste of the sweet potato Chinji roast is very good. Because of its taste, he was thinking of asking for more. Chinji then asked him about the taste. At the same time, Berkey's hand extended, planning to get some more but he paused and got flustered as he didn't know how to respond. He didn't deny that he was mad a while ago and he was worried about his pride if he would now tell the truth. Chinji on the other hand was waiting for his answer. She didn't know that Berkey's wanted to get some more. Berkey's hand was trembling, thinking of a way to be able to eat some more. By looking at him, Chinji was worried since his expression seemed to be disappointed so Chinji thought Berkey's didn't like it at all. It does taste good. However, I can't determine whether you leave or die on just one dish. With another dish, I'll be able to judge it better. Berkey said, his real intention is to keep Chinji with him and make her his food servant. Then, are you telling me to make you a different dish? Chinji asked, and Berkey's answered, yes. Are you not confident? Chinji then said that it was not she was not confident. She was just worried that Berkey's would still kill her no matter what she would do. Berkey's then wondered why she had this kind of thought if he had already given her another chance. No matter where you look, there is only gold and silver here. Even though I did find sweet potatoes in the midst of all this gold, gold is a treasure that one cannot make food with. So how can I make you a new dish with other ingredients if there aren't any? That's why I believe there's no difference from when you told me you were going to kill me. Even though you are the Dragon King, that is very cruel of you, Chinji stated. The last sentence she says makes Berkey's feel stabbed in his chest. He then understood that Chinji wanted to say that there wouldn't be any problem in making a new dish as long as she had the ingredients. Berkey's then snapped his finger while saying that he would send Chinji outside to gather all the ingredients she needed. The entrance gate suddenly opened the moment Berkey's snapped his finger. A beast that looked like a lion appeared and as per Berkey's, this thing is called a manticore. This beast was so tall and Berkey's added that there was a time this manticore ate humans, but today, it would only give Chinji a ride outside. He believes that Chinji would have a comfortable ride since the manticore has very fluffy fur. Chinji was speechless while staring at the manticore. Berkey's then told her to get on the manticore. Chinji then climbed the manticore, heading to the top. She was struggling and she was scared but it was fine for her knowing that this manticore served the dragon king so she was sure it wouldn't hurt her. Don't trick the manticore and think of escaping. Come back soon. Berkey said while the manticore started moving. Chinji was wobbling while riding the manticore. She was scared so she didn't have the chance to respond to Berkey's. The manticore then ran so fast, leaving Berkey's alone. Berkey's then realizes that he forgot to tell the manticore to not eat the lady. While heading their way, Chinji was screaming in fear. She was holding the fur as tight as she could since she was afraid that she might fall. Berkey's on the other hand was not bothered to call back the manticore and just prepared to sleep without worrying about Chinji being eaten by the manticore. The manticore was growling while running fast. Chinji at this time believes that she's going to fall off because of the speed. She was worried thinking that outside of the palace should be water so she didn't know how she could survive underwater. But then, when they finally came out, she discovered that she wasn't underwater. Outside was full of grass and trees. The manticore finally landed. He was scratching his body while Chinji gave thanks to him for the ride. She then looked around and she felt relieved that she wasn't underwater so there was also no need to worry about catching fish. She believes it's going to be hard to season with herbs and there's also nothing to replace barley or rice either so she decided to make a Korean pancake instead, a lotus root pancake to be exact. The manticore is still scratching its body so there's a lot of dust flying around which is why Chinji cannot pick the vegetables. The manticore was moving his body in a different position without Chinji knowing why. The truth is that the manticore feels itchy all over his body. A couple hundred years ago, the day the owner of the dungeon changed. The manticore was so happy after knowing that Kaiserus was finally dead. He waited so long for that day to come. It's been hundreds of years since he was trapped by Kaiserus that's why he's so thrilled knowing that he'll be freed. He was thankful to Berkey's for killing Kaiserus. He cannot speak like a human so Berkey's doesn't understand him at all. He growled, asking Berkey's to free him but then, Berkey's threw him outside the dungeon, commanding him to guard the exit and eat the humans. He was roaring, begging Berkey's to let him go but then, he was stuck again and got skin disease, fleas, and bad odor. Then after living in the dungeon for hundreds of years, the manticore's condition became a mess. Thinking about his situation makes him feel sad. 
While he was growling and moving around, Chinji was staring at him and realized that this manticore's actions were the same as her cat when the cat caught rubella which is a skin disease. She called the manticore and offered some help to scratch the manticore's back. The manticore didn't give a response but Chinji got a long stick and started scratching the manticore's back, hoping that it would consider her sincerity. Fortunately, the manticore feels better and it's been so long since he felt this feeling. He also hasn't felt relaxed in a long time. Chinji asked if he was now feeling better. The manticore felt like he was now a one-year-old manticore because of Chinji, and he could not believe that Chinji read his feelings exactly. Chinji offered to scratch another part of the manticore's body and the manticore was very happy with it. As per Chinji, rubella skin disease doesn't disappear easily so she decided to check the manticore once in a while. While she was poking the manticore with the long stick, the manticore started appreciating her kindness and he was hoping that he would be treated like this his entire life. Chinji was very happy knowing that the manticore was enjoying it, and that is how she unknowingly became friends with the manticore. After a few hours, they finally came back inside the dungeon. The manticore at this time was so fresh since Chinji washed him at the pond. Chinji then headed to Berkey's with the greens she picked. She sighed since she didn't know how to start cooking. While heading to Berkey's, Berkey's felt her presence and heard her sigh so he wondered about what problem Chinji had this time. At the same time in the other part of the dungeon, an armor was moving by itself, seemed like it had its own life. The armor got destroyed and the hand dropped on the floor. Going back to Chinji, despite seeing Berkey's sleeping, she still informed him that she didn't have a pan or lid or anything that she could use in cooking. Berkey's didn't respond and was still acting like he was asleep. Chinji moved closer to him and tried to wake him up. Berkey's was annoyed but still decided to look at her. He rose and asked Chinji what she needed. I am sorry for waking you, but I don't know if I can cook. Chinji said. She said that she wanted to make food for Berkey's as fast as she could but she didn't have the materials she needed to cook. Berkey's thought that Chinji was just asking him to let her use her nose to breathe again but then, Chinji explained to him that she needed a pan for the ingredients, a pot to knead the dough, a lid to fry the pancakes, a furnace and many more. She was very firm, saying that she needed all these kinds of stuff. Berkey's then instantly understood her but then she covered his body with a blanket and told Chinji that he didn't know any of it. Chinji then told him that she could not be able to make him a dash that would satisfy him if she didn't have the right tools. Also, she still remembers that Berkey's would eat her if he weren't satisfied with the dish, and if that happens, she believes she won't be able to return to her home. She pouted and fakely cried while saying that she thought she might happen to hate the Dragon King. Because of what she said, Berkey's immediately got up and asked her what he needed to do. Chinji looked at her with a cute face and Berkey's suddenly felt a strange feeling. Chinji then said that all she wanted was one small favor from the benevolent Dragon King. Berkey's was so disappointed as he had the feeling that Chinji was only trying to take advantage of him. He cannot also deny that Chinji is working hard with the task he gave her so he can't really say anything. He only told the lady to use anything she wanted since he really didn't know what tools Chinji was talking about. He told Chinji to search around since there was a lot of random junk in his palace. Chinji then told him that she could only see gold around them so she didn't know where to find what she needed. But then, Berkey's already lay down again and it was very difficult for Chinji to talk to him. Now, she doesn't have a choice but to search through everything. The manticore was growling behind her and was worried that she was now in trouble. He overheard the conversation between Chinji and Berkey's and he didn't want to let Berkey's eat Chinji. He tapped Chinji's back and waved his arms. He then gave a signal to Chinji to follow him. Chinji read the manticore's mind and the manticore brought her to the armor earlier. This armor is a living armor. With the use of movement magic, the suit of armor dealt with intruders and guarded the dungeon. Even though it could move with magic, if it didn't get the care it needed, someday it would rust and break down. 500 years have passed since it became scrap. Diho, are we at the right place? Chinji asked, and since then, she always called the manticore as Diho. Diho answered yes. Chinji then stares at the armor and understands that Diho wants her to fix it. The armor was moving itself and knowing about this armor made Chinji get more interested in this dungeon. She picked up its pieces and informed the armor that she would touch it for a second. The armor was still moving and Chinji decided to check its defect. She discovered that the rope is torn but she thinks she can tie it back together. The rope also looks very old and if she ties it too hard, it may snap again. But if she will tie it loosely, she believes it may come undone. After a few minutes, Chinji finished fixing it but she was planning on replacing the rope later on to make sure it wouldn't be destroyed again. The living armor stood and held Chinji's hands. It suddenly asked her to wait and after a few seconds, it came back with a shield and gave it to Chinji as his payment for helping him. This shield has an additional one-point defense. The living armor wanted to reward the defenseless-looking Chinji. The inside of this shield is round and hollow. If Chinji can take off the handle, she believes she can use it as a lid. Now that she looked at it, she was thinking that she could also use the helmet as a kneading pot and gloves as a grater. Master armor, would you mind helping me? She asked. 
Meanwhile, Chinji started preparing all the things she needed and also the ingredients. Since Berkey's doesn't want to help her, Diho is the one who gives her flame. She was grateful that Diho could also breathe fire. Diho was also proud that she was able to help back Chinji. Chinji gave thanks to them and told them to wait for a bit. Both were confused but followed what Chinji said. Chinji went to Berkey's who was still sleeping peacefully. Chinji bent down to level with Berkey's face. While staring at his face, she wondered how Berkey's, the Dragon King, would eat the pancakes if he would eat it in one bite or carefully cut it up. She concludes that Berkey's might burn his tongue or even hurt his mouth from eating the crispy ends. Even though it's just some shabby pancakes, she still wants to make it so that the Dragon King would enjoy it. She then stood to go back to her cooking area. She doesn't know that Berkey's was not sleeping. He was thinking about Chinji's name and described her in his mind as an innocent and naive lady, but the thing is that he doesn't know if Chinji has a secret motive. At this time, Chinji is now ready to cook. She asked the living armor to let her borrow the helmet. She then sat down while Berkey's told himself that this lady wouldn't be able to deceive him even if her food is good. Now, he was planning to discover Chinji's past and reveal her true self. Chinji on the other hand finishes chopping the mugwort and then starts grinding up the lotus roots and peas. She then added salt to it that was scraped off of the rocks and poured some water from the dragon palace's spring. While mixing everything, Berkey started using his magic to find information about Chinji. The first thing he saw in Chinji's memory was a loud neighborhood. He also saw the village where Chinji really came from. He had never seen this kind of building before. Everyone's clothes were also weird for him so she concludes that Chinji came from another dimension. He saw Chinji's father and Chinji when she was an infant. He also saw Chinji when she got younger and younger. Chinji was stitching late at night and seeing it made Berkey's wonder what she was doing. The moment Chinji hurts herself with the needle, Berkey's feels pity. She also witnessed Chinji carrying logs and suddenly tripped. Her father asked her if she was fine and she said yes when in fact her hand was scratched. Chinji is also a servant and she accidentally slips the hot food on her hand and lies to the ant that she's fine and isn't a big deal for her. Berkey's was annoyed listening to all her lies. For him, Chinji is very foolish and clumsy. The night when she burned her hand, she washed it in the river and she was worried as she wouldn't have a job for a while. It turned out that her father was blind and one monk suggested him to offer 300 sacks of rice so that he would be healed and get back his eyesight. Her father agreed to it and the monk then left. Chinji saw the monk and asked her father the reason of the monk's visit. Her father then told her with excitement that there was a way to open his eyes. The night came, Chinji was thinking of how she could get 300 sacks of rice. She was at the ocean again and there were two men talking about sacrificing themselves. There's no use in preparing. There is no one to sacrifice. Who would want to risk dying for 300 bags of rice? The man stated. Chinji overheard them. She immediately turned around and asked them to wait for a moment. She went to the men and asked them to repeat what they said. After knowing the details, she immediately rode to a boat and was ready to sacrifice herself for the sake of her father. She was trembling but what's more important for her is to save her father. That time, she remembered her father's story about the dragon king who lives in Andangsu. Her father is the one who told her that the dragon king lives in a palace full of gold with a maid and servants. Listening to the story about the dragon king makes her very amazed. After remembering the story, she then jumped into the ocean and wished that her father would have a long and healthy life. Going back to the present time, Chinji was still busy cooking without knowing that Berkey's already knew that she jumped into the ocean just to sacrifice for her father. He discovered that there's only one thing Chinji wanted, and that is to help her father open his eyes. Berkey's now confirmed that Chinji is a human from a different dimension and he guessed that it is also the reason why she thought Berkey's was a dragon king. He also believes that Chinji is a human who doesn't even know how to lie. At this time, Chinji only needs to fry the pancakes. She checked the shield above the flame and confirmed that it was already heated enough. She started frying it by pressing it with her hands and perfectly creating perfect shapes. Staring at the pancakes makes her remember her father since her father also loved the pancakes she always made. She then reversed the pancake and sniffled while telling herself not to worry about her father and just hope that he was fine now. After a short span of time, all the pancakes are finally done. She then went to Berkey's and gave it to him. Berkey's is still acting like he is still sleeping. Chinji then told him that it was better to eat the pancake while it was hot. Berkey's then opened his eyes and asked her if she was really done. He feels relieved that he managed to look like he had just woken up. Chinji then handed him the plate of pancakes while informing him that it is called lotus root and mugwort pancakes. Berkey's accepted it and said that it looked weird. According to Chinji, this dish is eaten in spring back in her hometown and is light and savory. She bowed down and politely told Berkey's to try it since she made it very sincerely. Are you ready? Berkey's asked, and Chinji's face was red as she answered yes. Berkey's this time was thinking if this pancake tastes better than the roasted sweet potato. He then grabbed one but he was disturbed the moment he saw Chinji collapse. He was able to catch Chinji and tried to wake her up but she wasn't responding. 
Despite that she collapsed, she was still waiting for the Dragon King's decision. Hey, wake up. Berkey screamed. He carried Chinji like a bride to let her lay down on his bed. He heard Chinji give thanks to him but he said, What do you mean by thank you? How long have you been overworking yourself? Chinji then said that she doesn't know. Berkey's touches her head and activates his power to heal Chinji. He sighed as he didn't know why he was doing all of this. He looked at the face of Chinji when Chinji called him the Dragon King. Am I allowed to go back home now? Chinji asked. Berkey sighed again and replied, If I send you off now, you think you are able to make it. He was annoyed by the fact that Chinji didn't think of it before jumping into the sea. In addition, traveling through dimensions isn't something that's easy to do. He covered Chinji's body with his blanket and sat on the floor while holding the plate of pancakes. Chinji instantly fell asleep while Berkey's decided not to let her work so hard next time. Also, he wants to make her stay longer to make him food. He swallowed one pancake and chewed it. But then, he got disappointed as it was too salty. He looks at Chinji and concludes that it might be because she's sick. He gets another pancake hoping that it would be better. Still, it was too salty. The next day in the nearby town, several people are running in the forest to escape from attackers. The attackers gathered all the people they caught and their boss, who was a tax collector, was disappointed to see less of the people. He was expecting to see 50 people and since it was less than 50, he blamed his subordinate and kicked him. Are you not going to do your job? He angrily said, and his man only apologized to him. The boss then forgets about it as he believes that those who escape can be found by his people. He then went to their tax collector head and he was very anxious to report that they only gathered less than 50 people. If they aren't going to pay, then, shouldn't you go get them yourself? The head replied, and the collector said of course and promised to catch those who escaped and take their taxes with interest. Whoever they go, since they are people of Yongji, shouldn't they be punished according to the law of Yongji? The head stated. The tax collector then went back to the Yongji village and he was already annoyed since he wanted to finish this job quickly and go back home. He declared to start the interrogation and then asked about who is the leader of these residences. Everyone was silent, which made the tax collector mad and unleashed his sword. The chief of the village then stood, claiming that it was him. Still, the tax collector was annoyed at him for not coming out sooner. Then I have a question for you. You are the Yongji people belonging to the Yongji nation, correct? He asked, and the chief of the village bowed down to him and answered yes. The tax collector then asked him if they knew that their tax issue was an act of protest against paying the sacred task. The chief answered yes and wanted to explain further but he was cut off by the tax collector. The tax collector is asking him another question, and that is if they knew what the punishment is for failing to fulfill the sacred tax obligation. The chief held the tax collector's knee and told him that their harvest was very bad which affected everyone and starved the children in their village. The tax collector commanded him to let go but the chief didn't listen and even told him that they could not pay five times the tax from last year even if the collector would take away everything from them. He was begging, telling the collector that they could not afford to pay for the tax amount, but then, the troops of the tax collector grabbed him and helplessly kicked him while telling him that they didn't come all the way here just to listen to his whining. The chief was in pain and his people were worried for him. Bad harvest, starving children, you must be joking. Then you should have worked harder, you should have worked with loyalty day and night for the lord. You should have farmed more. But what did you do? You slept all you wanted, ate everything you could, and didn't even pay your taxes. The tax collector said while pointing to the residents. The people didn't have the strength to answer him as they were afraid they'd be beaten up. The tax collector waved his hand while saying that these people had run away enough. One lady resident was about to explain their side but the tax collector held his sword and told them all that they were weak for lacking passion and effort. He then drew his sword and declared to kill these people with the charges of tax evasion and mutiny. All the food they still have would be confiscated and their village would permanently disappear. He raised the sword and the people were all scared to die. But then, they suddenly heard a loud noise. The tax collector was evilly smiling at them but he also wondered where the loud noise was coming from. Diho then appeared in front of them together with Chinji. He was growling while staring at the troops. The tax collector was scared upon seeing a huge manticore. I apologize for my sudden intrusion, Chinji said. A few hours ago, Chinji was cleaning the dungeon while Berkey's tried to sleep, but then, he couldn't sleep because of the noise Chinji made. He was mad as he complained but then Chinji informed him that it was already high up in the sky. She doesn't know that it is normal for Berkey's knowing that the sun rises every day. Chinji then told him that people have to wake up when the sun rises. I am not a human so I can sleep as much as I want. Berkey's replied, I've never heard of that before. Chinji said, Berkey's chose to believe her and he was thinking that Chinji acted this way because he didn't eat all the pancakes she made. He didn't eat at all because he thought Chinji would be hungry and would discover that it was too salty. He was also aware that Chinji chugged down five jars of water. It is good that you are cleaning. However, don't you think this is a bit too much? Berkey stated. Chinji organizes the treasures according to category which he believes is a very tiring job. 
Chinji offered him that she would also clean his bedroom but Berkey's won't allow her. He asked Chinji if she got enough sleep before cleaning so much, and Chinji answered yes and said that she slept for about 8 hours. Berkey's was confused since 8 hours was too little for him. But for Chinji, 8 hours is more than enough. Usually for dragons, talking about sleep, when they close their eyes and rest for 10 years, they would say that was a good nap. That's why Berkey's cannot believe that 8 hours of sleep was soundly. He also thinks that this 8 hours of sleep might be the reason why humans can't even leave up to 100 years old. He was staring at Chinji and concluded that starting the day she came, she would wake up every day and be loud early in the morning. And if that happens, he cannot think what would happen to his long nap. Also, if he chooses to kill Chinji, it would mean violating the promise and losing the power of the dragon. Now, he was thinking of a way how he could prevent Chinji from cleaning. Thinking about it makes his head hurt, but he comes up with the idea of showing candies to Chinji. He summoned candies and informed Chinji that these candies were hard at first but were sweet and would slowly melt in the mouth. But then, since Berkey's can summon things with his hands, Chinji concludes that he can also grant wishes. Berkey's handed all the candies to Chinji and ordered her to make some now. Chinji was puzzled and asked Berkey's what he just said. Berkey's said the same thing and he believes that there's no chance for Chinji to be able to make candies. Chinji doesn't want to die so she doesn't want to refuse Berkey's order. Berkey's smirked while waiting for Chinji's answer. He deduces that Chinji would stop cleaning just to make candies. He was so happy deep inside him as he was sure that he could now finally take a nap in peace again. So Dragon King, are you asking me to make you pine nut taffy? Chinji asked, and Berkey's then asked her if she could possibly be able to make it. But as per Chinji, her mind is at a loss with how she could make the taffy in a place like this dungeon. Berkey's was very happy with her answer. He even jumped out of happiness and then told Chinji that it doesn't matter if she's at a loss. According to Chinji, she needs barley or wheat to make the malt. She keeps on chattering without knowing that Berkey's has started sneaking. As per Chinji, she hasn't seen ingredients in the palace and she doesn't know where to get them or how she can make it here. Dragon King, you have put me through so much trouble to make food for you, are you listening? She uttered and turned her head around but Berkey's was not beside her. Berkey's was already lying down on his bed, covered with a blanket, then told Chinji that he would only wake up once Chinji was done with what he ordered. Chinji didn't respond at all but Diho suddenly appeared. Diho, do you think you can help me find the ingredients to make taffy? She asked, and Diho raised his one arm and tapped the other one on his chest while growling, saying that Chinji could trust him. That is the reason why they were outside the dungeon and came to the nearby village. Seeing people makes Chinji relieved knowing that there are people who also leaves here. The tax collector was afraid upon seeing a beast like a lion which he believes is bigger than an elephant. He stared at the paws of Diho, believing that his body would break up to pieces once these gigantic paws hit him. He raised his sword and tried to calm himself, but then, hearing the growling sound of Diho makes him tremble. He also saw Chinji above Diho and he could not believe that there would be a person who could ride a gigantic manticore, moreover, it was a young girl riding it. A situation where a young girl riding a thing like a gigantic beast and saying hello so peacefully is impossible for him, so, he concludes that the lady above the manticore is not a human, but a witch. At this time, Chinji got off from Diho and introduced herself. She asked the tax collector if he was the chief of the village and the tax collector lied and he answered yes. Shinji was nervous while informing the tax collector that she had come to carry out a request. The tax collector was so scared since he believed Shinji was really a witch. If you don't mind me asking, village chief, why are you holding a sword? Shinji asked, and the tax collector was startled and didn't know what to answer, especially since Diho was growling while staring at him. The tax collector was puzzled as to why Shinji was asking him this question. He doesn't know if it's better to honestly tell Chinji that he wants to kill these people with them. He concludes that Chinji might let him leave if he would tell the truth. He was afraid to lie thinking that Chinji might know it was a lie and would kill him. He was nervous and he was stuttering while trying to answer. But then, he really lied. He said that he was holding a sword because of a wolf. And as he answered this, he was afraid thinking that his life was now ruined. Chinji was shocked and concluded that this man might be talking about a dole, a native Asian wild dog. The tax collector answered of course and sheathed his sword. Since he lied, he wondered if Chinji believed him. He lied more to Chinji, stating that a wolf had appeared recently and had been terrorizing the people in this village. He feels like he was crushed the moment he hears Chinji say that she misunderstood his righteous intention. The tax collector was hoping that Chinji wouldn't know that he was lying. At the same time, Chinji looked at the people, believing that these people had gone through a lot knowing that a dole doesn't just take small animals, but would also take small children. She called the chief collector as village chief, and the tax collector was startled as he answered yes. Chinji suggested making a wall at the entrance of the village. She believes that the dole won't be able to jump over it as long as it's tall enough. That is an excellent idea, the tax collector replied. But deep inside him, he didn't have a choice but to agree because of his fear. 
He then looked at his men and ordered them to move quickly. His men were so puzzled as to why they needed to listen to Chinji. Since Chinji was behind him, he whispered to his men that they should follow Chinji since she was a witch. His men finally understood him and they were all scared. They then started chopping wood and they were all so tired after chopping and carrying so many. They didn't want to be caught lazy since the manticore was near them and they were afraid to death. They were also afraid thinking that they might become experimental samples for Chinji so they finished everything without resting. Then after a half day, the tax collectors successfully built a wall. Chinji was amazed since she never thought that a tall wall could be built very fast. The tax collector smiled at her awkwardly and he thought that Chinji would now leave. Because of your help, I'm a little ashamed of myself, Chinji said, and the tax collector was nervous again as he thought that he was now finally caught. But then, Chinji only asked him for some ingredients. The tax collector was puzzled but then he answered yes while wondering why Chinji wanted to get some ingredients from them. He glanced at the manticore and he trembled thinking that Chinji wanted his arms and legs. Chinji said that she only needed enough to be drained. The tax collector imagined that he would be squeezed to get oil from his body. At this moment, he was thinking about his deceased mom and suddenly collapsed which rattled Chinji. After a while, Chinji gets the ingredients she needs and she thinks she understands why the man collapsed and that is because the village barely had anything. Still, the residents, including the real village chief were so grateful for giving her some. Chinji gave thanks to Diho for helping her again and Diho growled with a wide smile as his response. Diho also repay the residents by giving them a hog and because of it, Chinji feels relief knowing that the village people won't starve and she can now make the barley malt without worrying. The next day, Chinji washed her ingredients and she was brought pot while walking back and forth in front of Berkey's. Berkey's was annoyed just by looking at him and he couldn't hold more so he decided to ask Chinji a question. He called Chinji and Chinji stopped to look at him and asked him what he needed. Can I ask you what you are doing right now? You've been walking around with that pot since yesterday. By any chance, are you eating things by yourself? Berkey's asked. Chinji then opened the pot as she believed that Berkey's was referring to it. But then, inside was only cold water which confused Berkey's. Berkey's then asked why she was carrying it and walked back and forth. He thought that Chinji was trying to play with water and he was also thinking that Chinji was intentionally doing it to bother him. But as per Chinji, when wheat seeds get hot, they begin to form buds, and to prevent them from budding, she's going to put them in cold water so that she can make barley malt. The seed what? It become hot. Are you a farmer? Berkey's asked while imagining a burning seed. Chinji said no and claimed that she was not worthy of being called a farmer since she had only been able to harvest peppers, lettuce, onions, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes, radish, crown daisies, sesame leaves, garlic, barley, wheat, rice, millets, buckwheat, sorghum, gourds, and peas. Berkey's clapped upon hearing it and he said he should call Chinji a pro farmer. This is why I'm working hard to make the most beautiful taffy for you, Dragon King. Chinji said. Berkey's seemed to feel happy that Chinji really did her best for him to taste a big taffy. He looked at Chinji and noticed something. He wondered why Chinji's hands were swollen and had a lot of bruises. As far as he can remember, Chinji's hands were fine when she went to make candies. According to Chinji, it will take at least five more days for her to walk back and forth while holding the pot of cold water. Berkey's was so disappointed thinking that he wouldn't be able to sleep for the next five days, and also, he believed Chinji's bruises would also last long until she was done. Because of this, he admitted to himself that he made Chinji do this for nothing. For him, there is a limit to working hard and he was worried that Chinji would get sick again for working too much. He then sighed and was confused as to why he was so concerned when in fact his main problem is he cannot sleep right now. He then told Chinji to continue what she was doing and Chinji said yes and told him to rest peacefully. She also informed Berkey's that she would wake him up after she was done. While saying it, she looked so excited, which made Berkey's wonder why. Berkey's lay down on his bed and covered his body with his blanket. He was staring at Chinji who was now walking back and forth again and he could not believe that he really cared about a small human. He then covered his face with the blanket but he could still think about the bruises of Chinji. He was kicking and kicking as he felt annoyed by the fact that he really cared for a human for the first time. After a few days, Chinji was done with the taffy oil, and the next thing she did was pull out a sweet potato. This is her main ingredient and he needed to steam it. But then, her problem is that it won't fit into her pot. She was thinking of cutting it knowing that there was a possibility it would fit but would also fall while steaming and she believed it might lose all of its sweetness. She headed back to the main room of the dragon's palace and put down the sweet potato then stared at it, wondering what she should do. She even wished she had a cauldron like the one she used in her hometown. 
She was thinking of asking for help from the Manticore but then she believes she already asked for help from Diho a lot so this time, she decided to just look for something to use by herself. She's planning on exploring the palace to check what she could possibly use. A few days ago, Chinji entered a room in the dungeon and saw more treasures. The treasures were sparkling and she said that the Dragon King certainly has a lot of treasures. As she came out, Diho was outside. She closed the door while asking Diho if the other rooms were filled with many treasures but Diho answered no. He guided Chinji to another room and inside had lots of paintings. According to Diho, before the dragon conquered this place, humans lived here. And those humans who lived here before were the ones who hung all the paintings. For him, these paintings were useless since they cannot be eaten so there is no point in collecting them. While he was growling, Chinji was just staring at the one painting in front of her. She believes that this painting is different from the others. Diho was growling the moment he saw Chinji about to touch the painting. Since Chinji won't listen, he growls very loudly which startled Chinji. Diho was just concerned that something would happen if Chinji touched it. Chinji at the same time thought that Diho was mad because she was about to touch the Dragon King's stuff. She then apologized to Diho and reasoned out that it was because of her curiosity. Diho kept on growling while tapping the floor but he was disappointed since Chinji didn't understand him this time. He suddenly pushed Chinji and tapped the painting. Several treasures dropped from the painting but it turned out that there was a trap. The floor where Chinji was standing before Diho pushed her had opened. This is what Diho means to say that it was dangerous for Chinji to touch anything. Chinji finally understands Diho and realizes that Diho only wants to save her. She then gave thanks to Diho and Diho was hoping that she would be extra careful next time since she was afraid Chinji would be in danger. For him, everything had been easy when Chinji came. Chinji bathes him and brushes him so he is cleaner than before. He raised his hand and swore that he would let Chinji know where all the traps were hidden. Chinji then chooses to trust Diho despite the fact that she doesn't understand him. On that day, Diho let Chinji discover all the traps in the dungeon including the rolling ball, sharps, and eruption. He also teaches Chinji how to face the traps. At the present time, Chinji started finding some tools she could use. She stepped onto a specific floor in front of the painting and it suddenly descended. The painting of a bow moves and arrows her. She then counts one to three and moves away so that she won't be hit. She successfully avoided it but she doesn't know if she counts too fast. She was glad that Diho helped her with the dragon's palace even though Diho was sleeping right now. If Diho hadn't told her what to do, she believes she wouldn't be traveling alone today. She continued to walk and was hoping that she could find something to use. The first room she entered had a lot of statues everywhere so she decided to look for another room. She was struggling while opening the door and when she was about to go out, she paused since she heard the sound of something. She was looking around and confirmed that the sound didn't come from the door. Is someone there? She asked. One of these statues is like a beast but it was a little bit dark so Chinji wasn't able to see it clearly. At the same time, Berkeys woke up and wondered why it was very quiet. He remembered that Chinji was just in front of her yesterday, walking around back and forth. He immediately gets up as he is worried that Chinji might have fainted somewhere. Still, he won't accept that he was worrying for the lady and he is also confident that he can still help Chinji if something happens since he still has some healing magic left. But then, he heard a loud noise. A bee passed by so he commanded it to check what happened. Based on the vibrations and direction of the sound, he thinks it was in the statue's room. He also concludes that Chinji was in that room and he was wondering what the lady was doing now. The monster Chinji is facing right now is Gargoyle, a secret assassin. A monster that is disguised as a statue and attacks when its victims have their guard down. 500 years ago, even when the owner of the palace changed, the gargoyle continued to stay in the dungeon and proudly said that he would protect the dungeon in any case. Berkeys told him that he would be more useful if he would stay around the things that look similar to him. That is why gargoyle decided to stay in the statues and waited for humans to come. But then, the gargoyle hadn't met a single human and stayed as a stone statue for 500 years. At this moment, he was waiting for Chinji to come near him. Chinji went to him and asked him if he was calling her. My name is Chinji. I began serving the Dragon King a little while ago. Chinji stated while bowing down to pay respect to Gargoyle. She stares at Gargoyle and asks him to take good care of her. But then, the Gargoyle sounds like whining rather than answering. It was using its own language, asking for him from Chinji. Luckily, Chinji concludes that Gargoyle is suffering from something like Diho and the living armor. Excuse me, by any chance, are you suffering from something? She asked, and Gargoyle is still uttering for help. The gargoyle was grinding and Chinji was thinking that she could put the statue into a steam-producing device to save it. 
She was pushing it to transfer from another area and she's planning to loosen up the stones. She was hoping that this area would have enough heat. The steam trap activates both water and fire magic at the same time, emitting hot and high-pressure steam from all sides. She grabbed a rock and while staring at it, she recalled the time when her grandma was sick a long time ago. Her grandmother caught a disease and won't work with just the steam. The people decided to stop treating the old woman and Chinji was also told by her grandmother to stop so that she won't get sick. In the end, her grandmother passed away after doing everything they could. Still, she believes the help she gave to her grandma isn't useless at all. That's why she believes that Gargoyle would be fine as long as she could give the right treatment. She positioned herself and threw the rock to the floor to activate the trap. She managed to hit it and the smoke then appeared. A bee also came to Chinji and this bee thought that Chinji was just doing the candy since it was the order given by Berkey's. As he was staring at Chinji, he wondered what Chinji was doing with the gargoyle. Chinji was very proud of doing the right thing. Because of what she did, the gargoyle started to gain strength and freed himself. Chinji called the gargoyle and the gargoyle was very happy that he could now move. The gargoyle flew towards Chinji and was amazed and grateful for what she had done. Chinji then told him not to use his energy too much for now since he just recovered. The gargoyle then promised that he would repay her the grace soon. He decided to prioritize Chinji's safety rather than the dungeon. Chinji at the same time found an opportunity to steam the sweet potato. Chinji and the gargoyle both found their solutions. Chinji was almost done and was excited that she'd soon be able to present a big and beautiful taffy to the Dragon King. The next day, she's planning to borrow Diho's fire and just use it moderately knowing that the taffy would become sticky too fast. She was stirring the taffy and always checked its consistency. While doing her job, Berkey's was staring at her, wondering how the food would come out if Chinji was only stirring it. He becomes interested this time to know the outcome of Chinji's hard work. When the night came, Berkey's woke up as he fell asleep unintentionally. Still, Chinji kept stirring the taffy so he decided to sleep back since Chinji also promised to wake him up once everything was done. The next day, Berkey's woke up, but still, Chinji wasn't done yet. He rose and wondered how much time had passed and if Chinji was like this the whole time. Chinji stood and Berkey's lay back and covered a blanket again to act like he was sleeping. Chinji wiped her sweat and was glad that she was finally done. She was also confident that she made it perfectly. She looked at Berkey's, thinking about what Berkey's would do to her if he didn't like it. She called Berkey's and asked him to wake up. The taffy was done and she told Berkey's to try it now. I made it well with all my heart. Will the food suit the Dragon King's taste? She asked. If it doesn't, it'll be a big deal. Berkey's replied, but deep inside him, he was looking forward to tasting it. Chinji was puzzled as she didn't understand how the dragon would eat her alive if he didn't like the taste. Berkey's was about to get some but Chinji moved the plate away from him. Berkey's was annoyed a little but Chinji turned around and walked away while saying that she was not different from the food ingredients so she concluded that Berkey's would cook her, fry her, or grill her. What's more scary for her is that Berkey's might eat her raw. She looked back to Berkey's and asked, Don't you have to cook first before you eat? Berkey's was stuttering as he tried to answer, but he could not tell the truth that he was just trying to scare her. As per Chinji, Berkey's seemed to be good at cooking at first glance, and she believes that Berkey's would cook her instead of having someone cook. She pouted while questioning if she would taste good. Now, are you worried that I might lose my appetite? Berkey's asked, and Chinji only glanced at him and didn't give any answer. Berkey's then claimed that Chinji was just curious about how he would cook her. Berkey's told her to stop what she was thinking. Chinji then bowed down and apologized to him for saying nonsense. She then told the Berkey's to now taste the taffy she made and Berkey's gave thanks to her. He gets one and observes that its color is normal with a little soft texture. He then swallowed it and bit it. It was so sticky and he continued to bite it but he seemed disappointed. At the same time in the tavern in the nearby village, people were chattering about the manticore. Don't worry, everyone. If it means justice and peace can blood freely in this world, I'm willing to do it, I will destroy the witch. The hero stated. Going back to the dungeon, Berkey's was panicking since the candy wouldn't break even if he tried so hard. Chinji was staring at him thinking that it might be the first time Berkey's had his first taffy. She then told Berkey's to calm down and instructed her to dissolve the taffy slowly in his mouth and savor it. She also informed Berkey's that the more he would force it, the more it would stick. Berkey's chewed it calmly and finally tasted the sweetness of it. It melts gently on his mouth and it really tastes savory. It tastes like sweet potatoes but different from a roasted sweet potato. While chewing it, Chinji informed him that she made it using the secret recipe she learned from her neighbor's grandmother who had skills far better than her. Berkey's was thrilled and almost told Chinji that it was very delicious. But he cut his word and went back to a poker face while saying that it was decent. 
He felt nervous knowing that he almost told Chinji that it was really delicious. He turned around while Chinji asked him what he meant to say that it was decent. To judge whether it's good or bad, it's too soon. Berkey's replied with crossed arms. He then told Chinji that he needed another bite to evaluate the taffy more. Chinji then honestly said that she thinks it isn't the right way to evaluate it. The Dragon King keeps saying these things. I'm starting to think it's all a trick. She added. Berkey's rattled by the fact that Chinji knows he's tricking her. Berkey's then looked back at Chinji and accused her of saying that he was lying. He fakely laughed and suddenly became firm while saying that he would show her that he wasn't lying. I'll go over to your hometown and come back. He stated. Chinji was surprised and Berkey's smirked and then repeated what he said. I've been so concerned about you that you misunderstood. Berkey's added and sighed. Chinji starts to become emotional and apologizes to Berkey's for doubting him. Berkey's patted Chinji's head and asked her if she now believed him. After a while, they went outside the dungeon together with Diho. Berkey's regrets saying that he would go to Chinji's hometown but he knows he needs to take responsibility for what he said. Chinji was whimpering and apologized to Berkey's for not being able to help him. Berkey's then sat down on a huge rock and lay down while remembering Chinji's hometown. But you, are you going to stay here? He asked, and Chinji answered, Yes, I will stand by your dragon king. Berkey's then bids goodbye to her and his soul then ascends. He was hoping that everything would be fine while he was gone. Both Chinji and Diho were staring at him, and at the same time, the hero from the nearby village appeared outside the dungeon and saw Chinji. At first glance, he believes that Chinji is the witch that the people are chattering about. While staring at Chinji, he was confused as to why a witch would walk in the daytime. He also noticed Berkey's body behind Chinji and he thought that Berkey's watched Chinji's offering as a witch. Because of his conclusion, he becomes furious. Chinji saw his existence but he instantly attacked Chinji and his attack created a red smoke. At this point, he immediately grabbed Berkey's body with the intention of saving him away from a tragic fate. He then slid away to dash back to his village. After a few minutes, Berkey's arrived at the hometown of Chinji. Looking at the people, he confirmed that the people had the same clothes. Also, the houses look pretty similar too so he believes he is in the right place. He was looking around hoping that he could find Chinji's father, H. Wang Judo and Dong. While walking, he heard people chattering but it turned out that it was only some kids. He also saw an old woman and tried to wave his hand but the old woman didn't see her. He felt so down after realizing that no one could see him so he could not ask anyone. A dog was barking at him and he became annoyed and ordered it to stop. All of a sudden, a shaman heard him and suggested him to come in. Don't you have questions that you seek the answer to? He added. Berkey's paused as he was surprised that he was heard by someone. You've noticed my presence. Well, aren't you a competent human? He said while slowly opening the door. The shaman then asked him to have a seat but Berkey's refused and asked about where he could find the person named H. Wang Judo and Dong. You must be lucky to find a gorgeous shaman like myself, who can masterfully bless and exercise, the shaman said but he was cut off and was scared the moment Berkey's entered. He thought that Berkey's was a ghost so immediately tossed rice and ordered him to leave. Berkey's was so confused and annoyed by the fact that it was just a waste of time. At this moment, a young man who was drunk was walking his way and stumbled to him. Berkey's was pissed off and told him not to drink if he cannot handle it. The man apologizes to him so he realizes that this man saw his presence. The man was asking for another drink from a grandma but the grandma was slapping him so he just sat down and cried. Berkey's then sat beside him and asked him if he could see him. The man fell down as he got scared. He was speechless and ran away thinking that he must be so drunk. Berkey's grabbed him and he screamed so loud. Hey, if you're going to keep yelling like that, I will separate your soul from your body. Berkey's said, and the young man gasped. Berkey's promised the man that he wouldn't get hurt as long as he answered his question. He asked the same question to this man and the man then guided him the way. He instructed Berkey's to go straight the way and cross the river twice. He said that he was sure about the way and Berkey's believed him and thought about how he would repay him. He pushed the man and let him sit down. He said that his name is Hong Gildong. Berkey's then pressed his back and then activated his power, informing Gildong that he would now bestow mobility magic in his left arm and flame magic on his right arm. He pressed back his magic power to Gildong, informing him that he'd be able to use his powers about three times a week if he practiced it for a year. Gildong was confused but then Berkey's didn't bother to explain further and instantly bestowed him with the magic powers. A flash then appeared in the area where it happened and everything was done after just a minute. But then, Gildong fainted and thus began the new chronicles of Hong Gildong. Meanwhile, someone was doing a painting in a dark house alone. It was Chinji's father, H. Wang Judo and Dong. Berkey's arrived at the house of H. Wang Judo and Dong and he could say that it was about to collapse at any moment. 
He slowly entered the house and heard Doan Dong uttering his daughter's name. Lots of drawings were also scattered and Berkey's wondered what it was. A lady suddenly came and scolded Doan Dong. There you go again. Do you think your daughter will come back to life by doing that all day? The lady angrily said. She snatched away the painting stick of Doan Dong and told her to forget about his daughter and just leave a happy life. She angrily asked Doan Dong if he was going to just let the 300 sacks of rice turn into stale. I should be blaming my fate for being forced to take care of this man. The lady added. Doan Dong apologizes to her and he calls her Bee Bean Duck's mother. The lady tapped her chest several times and Berkey's cannot explain what he just witnessed. Going back to the dungeon, Chinji was asking the hero to hand over the Dragon King to her. But then, the hero said that he won't allow it to happen. Do you think I wouldn't notice how you were sacrificing him for a ritual? The hero asked, and Chinji replied that Berkey's was the Dragon King she was serving. She is so anxious while explaining her side, and the hero then concludes that Chinji is saying that the young man he grabbed is Kaiserus, the one he thought was the Dragon King. Chinji then told him that the Dragon King's name was Berkey's and not Kaiserus. But then, the hero believes that Chinji is lying. He unsheathed his sword and told Chinji that even a three-year-old kid knows about the dragon cave which belongs to no one else but Kaiserus, the king of dragons. You did well trying to deceive me with some sloppy name like that. He added, Chinji was squeezing her hands out of fear. The hero then swore that he would wear a flower on his head for the rest of his life if what Chinji said was true. Is that so? What should I do to make up for being so sloppy? I guess I'll apologize, Berkey said behind the hero, and he now transformed into a dragon. Several hours before Berkey's returned, Diho was coughing as he was affected by the red smoke that the hero cast. The hero was hiding, believing that the manticore and Chinji wouldn't be able to survive with this. It was made with mega spicy chili pepper from Mexico, blue onion concentrate from Peta, and garlic powder from Lokia. It's a special tear gas meant to terrorize the senses, made from such infamous. The hero's intention is to rescue Berkey's, which he thought was the witch offering. But then, there was a critical error in his plan. Chinji's eyes sparkled as he planned to get some spices and he thought that the hero was a merchant who showed up to sell some to her. How much do you sell chili powders for? She asked while grabbing the hero's arm. The hero was shocked to see Chinji still conscious. He doesn't know that the girl he thought was a witch was a girl from the Joseon dynasty trained in culinary and housework. He smacked Chinji's hand and Chinji was confused as to why. At that time, the hero then grabbed Berkey's body and ran away. He slid into the hill leaving Chinji in confusion as to why this guy took the Dragon King's body with him. She rattled as she remembered the rumors that criminals often pose as merchant to kidnap people. Also, even if Berkey's wakes up in a different location, she believes it's possible for him that he might not return after sleeping. She started to cry thinking that she could not hear news about her father if the Dragon King could not return. She then asked Diho to help her chase the hero. But then, Diho doesn't want to since there is no reason for him to rescue Berkey's. In the end, the manticore couldn't refuse Chinji's request. At the present time, the hero looks at the dragon and he cannot believe that the man he rescued is really a dragon. He then clenched his sword as he saw this as his opportunity to slay the enemy of humanity and leave his name in history. You evil dragon, I shall rip off your heart and restore peace to the world. He screamed and charged at Berkey's. But then, his sword got broken the moment Berkey's snapped it with his claw. The truth is that the only thing heroic about Michael, the hero, was his looks. The first time he came to the nearby village, there were ladies peeking at him and instantly fell in love with his handsome face. For them, Michael shines. They called him a hero but his true job is just a courier. One day, when he was wasting his heroic looks in a delivery like usual, he faced bandits and the bandits ordered him to hand over everything he had in his bag. But then, the bandits whisper to each other as they feel like they have targeted the wrong person and wonder if Michael is not a retired hero. At that time, Michael was annoyed to see bandits blocking him away, and he also could not afford to lose the packages inside his bag. I'm giving you a chance to move out of the way. If you don't, there won't be any tomorrow for you, people. He yelled confidently which scared the bandits and became hesitant to steal something from him. They all then run away and Michael was surprised knowing that his bluff worked. He initially thought that it was all just a coincidence, not until someone planned to steal into his room but cancelled the plan upon seeing him and also the people respected him because of his aura. He became delusional with the idea of being a real hero because of how people treated him. Now, he told everything to Berkey's and Chinji and admitted that he was hoping he could save the world. He yelled, saying that he was really a hero. But then, Berkey's was not interested in his story. But as per Michael, he was rippled with disappointment and regrets as time went on. He knew all along that he was not the real thing, and he now regrets that he deceived lots of people.
He doesn't want now to be a hero to suffer and feel ashamed. He was always agonizing contemplating about the reason he was born into this world and what he should live for. Berkeys was annoyed listening to Michael and he said that Michael lived because he was born. I would rather choose death over life without a purpose. Please send me now so that I can repent for my incompetence, Michael said. But Berkeys didn't like the idea so he refused. For Michael, wouldn't dying in the hands of a dragon king be the most heroic way to perish? So he begged Berkeys to grant him a heroic death. No, I won't. Why should I bother myself with that hero fetish of yours? With annoyance, Michael cannot accept it to think that he can't also be a hero after death. Get a hold of yourself now. This girl has something to say about it. Michael added. Michael was sobbing and Chinji then sat down and asked him if he was fine. Chinji still called him a hero which surprised him. He recalled that he doubted Chinji's words earlier so he accepted that he's better off dead. Not until, Chinji asked him why he was easily throwing his life away. I don't believe that you're fulfilling your filial piety that way. Saying something like you deserve to die for being useless is not right. Chinji stated. Michael was speechless. Chinji held his hand and begged him to taste her cooking and reconsider his decision. Michael was confused but he chose to believe Chinji this time. After talking, Chinji then dipped into the river to search for something. Both men were waiting for her, and at the same time, Berkeys was thinking about how he could tell Chinji about what really happened in her hometown and her father. Even if he explains the situation to Chinji right away, he believes there's no changing the fact that Chinji can't return at the moment. He knew that Chinji misses her hometown a lot, especially her father, but he would still tell Chinji since it was his promise but not for now. He went to Chinji and asked her what she was holding. As per Chinji, it's called Dasulgi which has edible inside and can be cooked with other ingredients. Michael saw it and he seemed don't like it since it was an insect looking for him. Berkeys then calls him a hero wannabe and concludes that Michael isn't happy and is picky despite that he can eat for free. Michael was trembling and suddenly ran away from Berkeys and asked Chinji if there was anything he could help with. But then, Chinji told him to just rest since the water was very cold. Michael was shocked that Chinji was going through the trouble by herself in the cold water. After an hour, Chinji was done getting enough of the dasulgi. She called Michael and borrowed a pot for her. Michael then searched his bag and successfully found it. Chinji then puts all dasulgi in the pot and dashes back to the river while telling Chinji to keep on resting. Chinji washed the dasulgi in the river while Berkeys was peeking and asked her what she was doing. According to Chinji, the dasulgi will eventually excrete once kept underwater. She carried the pot of dasulgi that had water while telling Berkeys that they needed to give the dasulgi enough time to spit out everything like sand and sediments. Berkeys asked if it can't be forced to spit but as per Chinji, the dasulgi would resist and the smell would remain if the desedimentation won't go well. Both men were staring at it. Chinji then informed them that the water must be replaced three times every two hours so he should now go pick some pine needles in the meantime. Berkeys asked what the purpose of it but Chinji only said that everything had a purpose. He then rode to Diho and waved goodbye to the men. Both men also waved at her and they were so awkward after Chinji left. Three hours later, Chinji came back and cleaned everything with water. She didn't take a rest at all. After cleaning, she said she'd be off to pick some vegetables. Aren't you tired? You don't have to prepare that much, Berkeys said. Chinji only gave thanks for his concern and promised to come back immediately after gathering enough ingredients she needed for her dish. And Berkeys just looked at her leaving. When she arrived, she was still working, draining the ingredients. Berkeys was mad seeing Chinji work too much again, and he blamed Michael so he was planning on getting rid of him. But then, Chinji said that she could now take a break since she already soaked the dasulgi enough time, and is now ready to be broiled the next morning. She arranged everything so Berkeys said, You said you were going to rest but what are you doing now? Chinji then replied that she now needed to start a fire since it gets cold at night. Berkeys then said that coldness doesn't matter to him. Remember that your health is what determines the well-being of the dragon place. Like what they say, the king's health is what brings fortune to their nation. So please keep on resting. Chinji replied. Berkeys sighed since Chinji was very hard-headed. Chinji then told him not to worry about her since she would be done after setting the fire. At this point, Berkeys moved her aside and snapped his finger. A fire has been made in just one snap and he told Chinji to now rest since the fire is already set up. Chinji was shocked and just answered yes. It's already night and everyone is prepared to sleep. Luckily for Michael, he brought a sleeping bag but when he was about to lay down, Berkeys grabbed it so Michael sunk into the grass. Michael then asked him where he was supposed to sleep. Where to sleep? You can do that here. Berkeys replied while pointing at Diho. Diho the, grabbed Michael and licked his body. Berkeys then went to Chinji and reminded her to rest and Chinji then said that she was just worried that the fire would go out. 
Berkey's covered the blanket to Chinji and told her not to make a salty dish like the last time when she had a cold. The fire might go out if I don't take care of it, and Dragon King will feel cold, Chinji said. Berkey's reached her and leaned her on his body. With this, he said he now feels so warm and comfortable. Still, Chinji said that she had a duty to fulfill. Then, what if you collapse like last time from tending the fire overnight? Huh, don't you know that your mouth will go sideways from sleeping in places like this? When I start a fire and tell you to rest and sleep, what should you do? Huh, it would be great if you could just say, as you wish Dragon King. How great would that be, huh? Who's going to cook those dasulgas after all the trouble they went through? Won't you feel sorry for them? Are you heartless? Were you that kind of a person? Is that it, huh? Berkey's said angrily while grabbing Chinji. Chinji chuckled and Berkey's just sighed and smiled at her. He patted Chinji's head and leaned him back to him, telling her to rest. They both said goodnight to each other and finally slept. That's all for today, thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you wish to have another part of this recap, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. Until next time.